I'd like to begin with a story. In the summer before last, my wife went away for an extended weekend to go to a conference in Washington, D.C., and she left me all alone in the house with nothing but a bottle of cheap vodka and some diet root beer, which I promptly mixed together, making a surprisingly refreshing cocktail. Now, lots of names have been suggested for this cocktail, but in the end, I prefer just the plain old root beer. So, here I am, all alone with this root beer, when I remember that my friend and sometimes musical collaborator, Julia Willings, has lent me this little purple ukulele. When you combine those two things with a little extra time on your hands, this is what happens. and start playing Right My Fire. I had been a student of music for years before I got to the point where I could write a song or arrange a song. But you know, just studying music is not enough. To really do music, you have to do music. And that means learning to play a musical instrument. And that, in turn, means thousands of hours of practice, most of the time playing the wrong notes. So anybody that's learned to play a musical instrument knows the road to proficiency is paved with ear-assaulting cacophony. It's just awful. And that sounds a lot to me, though, like an engineering education, which takes at least four years of post-secondary education to get good at. And it requires you to learn to play the tools of engineering, problem-solving techniques, hardware, software, all those things, thousands of hours of practice in the form of homework, labs, and projects, most of the time getting it wrong, as exemplified by professors bleeding buckets of red ink all over their students' work. So in the end, if you want to be an engineer, or you want to arrange psychedelic pop tunes on ukulele, it takes a long time and a lot of dedication. Way number two that I saw these things being the same activity is that they're both applications of acquired skill sets to brand new situations. Now I'll let you in on a secret here. I'd actually never played ukulele before. Um, but I have played guitar for years and years and years. There are similarities, but the guitar is big. It's got six strings. The ukulele is tiny. It has only four. And the notes those strings are tuned to are different for the two different instruments. But I was able to take something that I knew how to do and modify it and adapt it to this new situation. And every time you arrange a song, it's a different song. Like my fire is not Purple Haze, right? Purple Haze isn't Moonlight Sonata. So everything has got its unique set of challenges. This is what engineers do every single day. Project managers don't go to their engineers and say, today, why don't you go to your thermal book and work problem 414? They don't do that. They say, take the stuff you learned and apply it to this new situation entirely. And every new engineering problem is also unique. So engineering and arranging doors for solo ukulele both represent modifying and adapting what you know and what you can do to new situations. We're also talking about huge amounts of research and analysis that go into both of these activities. Now, of course, I knew the doors like my fire, but I never analyzed it. So I had to sit down and listen to it over and over again and pick out the individual notes, the individual chords, and really understand it. I was not unaware that other people had attempted exactly the same thing. It would be silly for me not to consult those things. So I sought out other people's transcriptions, and sometimes they were wonderful, and it got me through some places I got stuck. Other times they were just flat out wrong. And how did I know they were wrong? Because I figured it out on my own. But you know, believe it or not, there's no official transcription for this for a ukulele. So in the end, it was I who had to be the judge of what was right and what was bogus. Again, engineers do this all the time. You really have to do a lot of analysis to be an engineer. But you're crazy if you don't consult previous work first. You're on your own to find that work as well as assess its validity. And there are no answers in the back of the book to tell you right or wrong. So, once again, we see the similarities. It's up to you, either as an engineer or as an arranger, to hunt down information as well as to decide if it's accurate or if it's even relevant to what you're trying to do. 
four, these are both problems of constrained optimization. And to tell the truth, this is where I knew that what I was doing was really engineered. The Doors, original tune, has got a keyboard part, it's got a bass part, it's got a guitar part, a drum part, a vocal part. And I wanted to do all of that at one time on one instrument that's got four strings and barely a two octave range. That's a huge number of constraints, but that's exactly what engineering is. When you do that, you've got some wiggle room, but you have to navigate your way through the wiggle room to create the best product. What parts do I take out? Because it's impossible to play all of them. What parts do I leave in? I take out too many you don't recognize the song, or maybe worse, you recognize it, but you don't like it. And anybody that hears this can actually do this. Anybody can do this, if you have enough time, right? I didn't have a lot of time. My wife was coming back soon, and she wasn't going to put up with this much longer, right? And what was making matters worse, I was running out of diet root beer, too. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to go out on the limb here. I'm going to say, not only is this like engineering, I'm going to say this is the very definition of engineering. That is solving problems in an environment of certain unalterable constraints. And here's just kind of a mundane example. You've got to design a heat exchanger. It's got a certain load. It's got to be small enough to fit in the closet. You can't change those things. So what you do is you change the things that you can, looking for trade-offs between the two to create the best product, all the while being cognizant that you don't have all the time in the world, and you don't have all the money in the world. Engineering is about doing the best with what you have, but also ensuring that, that best is, in fact, good enough. And the final way that I was pretty sure what I was doing was engineering was that I was learning so much. Every time I do engineering, I'm learning more about engineering. Here's just a short list of things that I learned when I was engineering this tune for ukulele. First off, I learned how to play an F-sharp minor chord. Okay? So if you play ukulele, you'll get that and go, of course that's an F-sharp minor. Remember, I'm coming at this from the uh, perspective of a guitarist. I'm applying an acquired skill set to a new situation, right? So when I figured out this chord, I didn't think F sharp minor. I thought, that's a D major 7 chord, but without the D. And then I thought, wow, if I take any major 7 chord and I drop the root, it becomes a minor chord two whole steps up. Now that might not mean anything to you, but to me that meant, oh my god, how did I play music for decades and not make the connection between those two chords? And once I started making that connection, the connections just started rolling in. I remembered another epiphany I had in graduate school, and I realized that Fourier's law of conduction, relationship for shear stress in a Newtonian fluid, the mass transfer equation, are all the same equation. They were all fixed laws of diffusion, just applied to different things. And then I thought about, well, equations are all those little black dots and lines that tell us what notes to play when. Can we think of this as the equations? of music? And conversely, can we think of all these squiggles and Greek letters as really being the sheet music of engineering? And while we're on the topic of notation, I got to start thinking about that thing. That's called a chord diagram. This is a way of abstracting this picture to cut through the clutter to go for understanding. You get rid of fingers and you replace them with little black dots instead. This is kind of what an engineer does when he's interested in, I don't know, understanding what happens when a man pushes on a refrigerator. They don't draw pictures of the refrigerator with the magnets all over it, and a picture of the man with his fingernails and his nose hair, or that kind of stuff. No, they draw a picture that looks like this. It cuts through the clutter, replaces things with a bunch of arrows. It's called a free body diagram. Are those the chord diagrams of engineering? And speaking of chords, remember these two things I said were related to each other? Here's another chord that I play. That's called a B minor 7. Yet another chord. Now, you guys are pretty bright. You may have never seen chord diagrams before, but you're doing those are exactly the same notes. And you're right, they are exactly the same notes. So how is it that they're two different chords? If you play those four notes first, and you follow by those two chords, it's a B minor 7. But if you play these other chords first, and follow it by those four notes, they are now a D6. Because it's the relationship that they have with other chords that makes them what they are. And then I really went crazy, and I thought about what Gregory Bateson said years ago, which is, you know, what if relationship is what it's all about? What if we've got it all wrong? As engineers, we think about, here's this thing that's hot, here's this thing that's cold, and therefore energy goes from the hot thing to the cold thing. What if that's completely upside down? What if it is energy goes from thing one to thing two, and that's what makes thing one hot? and thing too cold. Is this what I discovered with engineering the ukulele? Were they not really two different things? Were they just two different manifestations of one higher order relationship? Each one being some kind of yin and yang that is internally in the process of becoming the other one. Have I, in short, arranged the doors for solo ukulele and achieved enlightenment?
Maybe. Or I could have just had one too many root beer cocktails. Which brings us right back to the beginning of the presentation, leaning on, eh, I'm not so sure about this. And I'm actually okay with that. Because in the end, these are just two of the millions of activities that we engage in every day that make us human. And I decided to lump those things together. And you might not like that line. You might want to erase it and draw that line instead, or that line, or that line, or that line. And all of those lines are okay, because the boundaries that delineate the human endeavors that we engage in are fluid, but they can't be arbitrary. And every time we draw those lines, we're engaging in classification. And we need classification for understanding. It doesn't happen without that. But I submit to you that we only have better understanding through better classification, and we certainly don't have any new understanding without new classifications. This is a necessary condition for innovation, and I might even think it is exactly the same thing as innovation. So let me leave you with this one last thought that I've stolen from the philosopher James Carson in his very small and remarkably profound book, Infinite and Finite Games, in which he visualizes all of life as being play of possibility. And in such a life, we necessarily find ourselves playing what he calls finite games, games that are defined by certain boundaries. But we also have the potential to play what he calls infinite games, where we're playing with the boundaries. And not everybody should play ukulele, but I think all of us should strive to become infinite players.